thanks very much that you've come in quite good numbers. We're just about to start, so that's very good. Right, that's fine. Okay, so as um, mentioned last week, this week we have, um, this is our third visiting lecturer, and this time we have a person from working within London, but working on all sorts of very interesting issues around language and health, especially in Africa. But today, Professor Tope uh, Omonyi, who is from Roehampton University, where he is a professor of sociolinguistics and also runs a language, uh, a center of language research, will be talking about something he said he hasn't been doing for a while, which is talking about issues around religion, language, and hip hop music. Uh, he'll probably talk for about 40, 45 minutes, but it would be really good if we could have a few questions after. Okay, so uh, think about what you might want to ask. Over to you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me to, uh, to SOAS. It's always good to come back here. It's almost become like a second, a second home or a second base for me in London. So, um, yes, I haven't spoken uh, or talked hip hop now for about four years. Four years? Four years to a gathering such as this. I've done the old conference paper or so uh, outside of the UK. Uh, so this is, this is a welcome return to something that I was a little bit passionate about. But I think I'll begin with a disclaimer. Uh, I was watching an interview of uh, uh, Denzel Washington. <coughs> this must be about a decade ago. Now, you, know, you think back a decade ago, where were you? What were you doing 10 years ago? Yes? Uh-huh. And, and Denzel Washington, on that interview, was asked whether he regretted the fact that he went into film rather than hip-hop. And at that point he was just turning 50, I think, if I recall correctly, on the verge of 50. And he said, well, no, he was comfortable where he was at, that um, as an actor, the future was still his. But there weren't that many 50-year-old rappers around the place and it, it was so humorous that day and I thought, I thought about it then and wondered where are the 50 year old rappers that are still you know on stage anywhere if they are not dead at 25 or 30 uh, they are retired, retired at maybe 35 or 40 um, so that made quite some sense so when you think about me now uh, having hit 60, now standing and talking about hip-hop. I said, what was that six-year-old man doing talking hip-hop? What does he know? Now, hip-hop hip -hop has outgrown me, so some of the things that you're likely to hear this morning uh, are also things that uh, are maybe a little bit dated, but I'm going to try and, uh, try and make it, uh, try and make it as, as current as possible. Uh, essentially, what I want to do uh, is to explore holy hip hop because we're all used to hip hop. Hip hop is, is the conventional. So when you use an adjective like that, or pre modification, as those of you in linguistics would understand, holy pre modifies hip hop. That means that this is a kind of hip hop. Yeah? As soon as you pre modify, it's not the mainstream because the mainstream does not need pre modification. So this is a kind of hip-hop. And what I'm claiming is that it's a consequence of cultural transformative and hybridizing processes. Uh, cultural transformative, what, what does that mean? What does that mean? Cultural change, social change, a shift or shift, hybridizing, the coming together of cultures. Yeah? Now, the cultures that are coming together as far as holy hip hop is concerned, are secular cultures and religious cultures. Yes, yeah? secular cultures and religious cultures. But secular cultures, these are, are social, normal, everyday uh, 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 things that we do, things of the world that we do. <coughs> so those are getting mixed with religious culture. 
And in language, because we are students of language, we see how religious language takes on uh, secular values and vice versa. Yeah, vice versa. So, holy hip hop as an aspect of sociocultural change. There's this, this book from 2010. It's an edited volume uh, in the SLR uh, subfield. SLR stands for Sociology of Language and Religion. The Sociology of Language and Religion Change, Conflict, and Accommodation. And it's in this book that I first set out uh, holy hip hop, you know, as, as, a field of, as a field of inquiry and um, the ways in which it differs from hip hop as we know it. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little bit about hybridity and globalization. I've been told not to make this uh, too, too theoretical. So that you can you can enjoy because it's fun. This is this is a fun area. I I tell you how I came into researching researching this. I I loved hip hop music. I still do to some extent, and and spent a huge chunk of my of my salary buying CDs and, and stuff like that uh, that people felt was ridic that ridiculous amounts of money. You know, doing that, and uh, when I when I calculated over the course of, of six months, how much I had spent on this, this love of mine at the time, I decided it was necessary to get, apart from the enjoyment of the music, it was, it was necessary to get something else out of it. So that's when I began to think more seriously about what it can add in terms of quality to my scholarship, my research. So would attempt to define and theorize what it is, and then the kind of methodology that you use in, in, this, in this field, this area, and then a little bit of data as well. Hip hop studies. This is something that you find in cultural studies, you find it in sociology, you find it in religious studies now, religion and hip hop. Yeah? So there are several disciplinary areas that are interested in hip hop. That's why we say it's multidisciplinary. But it is also interdisciplinary when you think about the theoretical frameworks that are used in engaging with issues uh, around hip hop. So it's possible. And as you will find, some of the references that I have here are not people in linguistic study. So Homi Baba, for example, uh, is from cultural studies and sociology. So they draw on uh, multiple theoretical frameworks within different disciplines. And that's the justification we have for that. Okay. Between sacred and secular, negotiation and appropriation, the title that we started with, if I just double back, between JC and JZ, what do you think JC stands for? Anyone? Jesus Christ, absolutely, that's, that's obvious, yes. <laughs> between Jesus Christ and JZ. Now, a lot of people would not say the two things, hip hop and Christianity, or JC and JZ, in the same syntactic string. Yes, in the same syntactic string. Because the one is sacred and the other is secular. Yes, the one is sacred and the other is secular. But what we're saying now is there is actually some kind of towing and throwing uh, going on between the sacred and the secular, okay? Some kind of negotiation. And resources of the sacred are being appropriated in the secular, and resources of the sacred are being appropriated uh, in the secular. So both, both ways. So if you think about Kanye West, for example, 
There are some songs that he has done where he has some religious references and he mentions Jesus. Does, does that make his music holy hip hop? No, he's, he's doing conventional hip hop, but he's drawing on some of the resources of the sacred. Okay? Because in some of those songs he still uses what you might describe or refer to as swear words. Yeah? Transnational cultural events as a framework. So in other words, we can also look at uh, these negotiation and appropriations that we're talking about from the point of view of beyond the nation state boundary, uh, cultural events that bring together uh, people from different uh, uh, national backgrounds, or national contexts. So when you talk of the Grammys, for example, the Grammys bring together artists from different parts of the, so there are British artists there, there are French artists, there are German artists, there are US artists who are all there at the Grammys. The Mobile Awards, okay? Uh, so this, these kinds of events, uh, this is just music. Of course, in, in film, uh, Hollywood, you know, the globe, and uh, uh, other uh, award ceremonies that you have, uh, quite a lot of those entail or involve uh, cross-border cross -border movements of culture and of practitioners of culture, those, those people. And I've just cited, uh, again, 2006, that's 11 years ago. This, these were the, the groups that I became interested in at the time, in Thais, uh, who were performing at the Excel Center at the time. We had to go and uh, uh, try and watch them. And um, now I have got a PhD student who is researching Polish transnational uh, hip hop artists who are going back and forth between London and Warsaw, performing here and performing there. And they have fans who travel with them, who go and watch their shows, and all of those. And there are issues of identity. So the negotiation that we talked about is not just uh, negotiating uh, uh, trading cultures, but also how identities shift when these movements, when these movements occur. Okay, um, I skipped that. Several confluences, meeting points, uh, cultural in-betweens, uh, in-betweeners, yeah, in-betweeners. Now, so it's n neither there nor there. They're in-between. And this is the hallmark or the, the base claim of Homi Baba's uh, The Location of Culture from 1994 uh, and his definition of what hybridity is. In sociolinguistics, we have since tapped into that. And so uh, people talk about third culture. Yes, they talk about third culture, uh, which is uh, hybrid. It's a hybrid, hybrid form. Uh, more recently, uh, or in traditional social linguistics, people would talk about code switching in between A and B, and now they talk about translanguaging. And I say, well, it's, it's not moving between A and B, it's actually uh, one kind of, of code which has elements from uh, both of these. So translanguaging would, uh, in, some people's, in some people's conceptualization, would be, uh, would show elements of uh, hybridization or hybridity. The idea that you have all of these people who subscribe to hip hop and recognizing hip hop as a culture. You know, hip hop is a, is a way of life. It's a, it's a view, a world view. Yeah? So they refer to the hip-hop nation. And, it, and the hip-hop nation 
uh, is such that it doesn't recognize the territorial boundaries that, that we have, uh, or the United Nations, okay? Uh, so whether in Japan or in Malaysia, or in London, or in Johannesburg in South Africa, or in Brooklyn, that membership is recognized of that community. I think in our, our, our linguistics, some people would also say, maybe that's a discourse community, or they might call it a community of practice, depending on what angle they were coming at. You know? So, that, that nation has a language. Right? That nation has a language, and that's a way that hip-hop artists talk. They have some uh, uh, um, uh, registers uh, uh, that, that they, we associate with them. We recognize, recognize uh, them by. Okay? Uh, so if you, if you, for example, have, and, and it's not exclusive to them now because it has permeated uh, uh, the social scene. So you hear, you hear a lot of people go, yo, yo, what's up? Yes, yo, what's up? Uh, I don't know how they do those fingers. Is there anybody here? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> See, I told you there are better hip hoppers here. All right, good. So they have, they have all those things, and they, they have meanings. Uh, so the language. I also want to mention that the language is not just in the oral. Yes? It's also uh, uh, a broad, a, in a broad sense, uh, couture. Yes? Couture. The culture. It's a language. Yes? It's a language. It's an expressive code, how they, how they dress. Uh, I, I, I was, I'm convinced that I, I'm past my, my sell-by date. Uh, as, as a hip hop, hip hop person, but I thought I'll show you. Um, so, in the past, that I've had uh, bandana and, uh, and, and some other things on my grills and my teeth, but uh, you can see my gray hair now. And that would re really look ridiculous. So, you're not allowed to laugh. Okay. So, I have a bling. Yes? Bling. He's all blinged up, yes? Aha. Uh -huh. Now, that's part of the paraphernalia of membership in that community. Yes, part of the paraphernalia. Because I'm talking holy hip hop, what I've got there is a cross. Yes, I've got a cross. Then I've got, I've got something from Judaism. There as well. Okay? Okay. Um, glossolalia, I don't know how many of you have heard this term before. Glossolalia? Right, okay. This was something that was in social linguistics lit literature in 1971. Where were you in 1971? <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, 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 Samarin. Yes? Samarin, 1971, uh, coined that. And it, it's, it's what we call in modern day parlance uh, speaking in tongues. Do you know speaking in tongues? Yes? Uh, uh, evangelical Christians. Uh, speaking tongues. And that's what Samarin called glossolalia at that, at that time. And he claimed, or people have claimed, that it is possible uh, to do a phonological analysis of glossolalia and be able to tell what it is that... It sounds something like this, glossolalia. That's speaking in tongues. Now, when you record that, and then you try and do a phonology, I'm not convinced that the thoughts in my mind or in my head, as I said what I just said, that an analysis by a sociolinguist will expose what I have just thought and prayed about in that. But as a scholar, I would not foreclose it. But it's intriguing. Yes, it is intriguing. Now, access to that is like access to the language that hip-hop artists also use. Because if you're not used to the code, 
then you might exactly you might not really uh, be able to decode what's going on. But the nation knows it, and one of the one of the proponents of the existence of this nation, hip hop nation, is Alim Sami, who operates out of Stanford University in the United States. Okay. Globalization of religion uses the same conduits, the same channels, and tools as the globalization of culture. The globalization of culture is about flow. Yeah? So if religion is flowing through the same conduits as culture, then we can understand how hybridity may be inevitable. Yes? May be inevitable. It's like crawling through a tube. Uh, whether you're a good guy or a bad guy, if you both crawl through the same tube, whatever coloring is in the inside of that tube, when you surface on the other side, both of you would have evidence of having come through that tube. Yeah? Okay. Emergence of multiple centers and alternative narratives. Now, a lot of people tell a story. That's the, because hip-hop is about, they say, it's, it's about telling stories. But the story or the narrative, the mainstream narrative, is that this is an American form. It's something that grew out of America, out of Brooklyn. But today, we have multiple centers. Or oh, there's, there's a debate that there are other centers apart from from the American story. Now, there's a book that we use in sociolinguistics, The Ethnography uh, of Communication, that is edited by Del Himes and John Gompers. Do you know that book? Gompers and Himes? No? OK. Uh, check it out. Directions in Sociolinguistics Ethno and Ethnography of Communication is a useful, it's a useful book. And in that, in that book, there is a chapter on Turkish adolescence, verbal dueling, verbal dueling. And when I read that article or that chapter, I had no clue. This is so long ago, I had no clue what, what hip hop was. Hip hop was, was not a big deal then. But already, Gumpers and Himes had a chapter on Turkish adolescence verbal dwelling. And what verbal dwelling is, is two opponents who face each other, and they use poetry to insult one another. So I would insult you, and your take up must rhyme with something that I have, maybe the last word or something like that. And if he doesn't, then you have lost the battle. And it goes back and forth like that. So Turkish adolescents were doing verbal dwelling before hip-hop battles became known. So do we want to say that the Turkish adolescents learned it from, from, from uh, uh, the US? No, they didn't. No, they, they didn't. Are there any Turkish people here? Ah, I saw you smiling, I guessed. Yes. Do you recognize this, this verbal jewelry thing? Absolutely. Now, but from what I gathered, girls don't do it. Or do girls do it now? Girls do not do it. Girls do not do it. It's a boys thing. Right. Um, so those, the verbal dwelling. So that's one, that's one example of why we need to think about these multiple centers rather than uh, a US narrative. So the alternative narratives. Uh, uh, Dara G, that's a Senegalese group that was famous in the 90s. Um, not so much these days. And they did an album which had uh, uh, one song in it that they called The Boomerang. And that was an alternative, an alternative uh, uh, narrative too. You know what the boomerang is? When you throw the boomerang, it goes away and then it comes back to you. So what they claimed was that this thing that you are ascribing to the US actually was born in Africa. 
this out of the tradition of the grill, you know, the, the storytelling uh, 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 practice or culture on the West African coast. And, and it went with the Middle Passage. The Middle Passage is about slavery. So when slavery happened, they took their storytelling narratives and their storytelling practices with them to the plantations. And this was what they entertained themselves, entertained themselves with uh, over time. Now, so they said, storytelling started here, it went with the Middle Passage to America, and it has come back home. So when you talk about Daraji at that point, they say, well, no, we're not copying America. We're doing something that we've always done. We had it, we sent it off, and it's not come back to us. So it's ours. We're not borrowing. Okay. So I explained at the beginning, talking about the modification, that uh, holy hip hop was a, a subgenre. Some people would describe it as alternative alternative hip hop. Now that's that's open to uh, to contestation. It is defined by the community of practice. Who are the people who do holy hip hop? Pentecostals. Yes, Pentecostals. In Christianity. But you also have uh, Muslim hip hop. Yes, you have Muslim hip hop. At the time that I was working on Entice and, and one or two other, G Force, uh, there was a group out of Birmingham or Man Manchester, I think it was, and they were called Mecca to Medina. Yes, Mecca to Medina. They were, uh, in the language of hip, hip hop, badass rappers. Yes, they were badass rappers. Uh, I had to say that because we need to realize that it's not just uh, in Christendom that you have holy hip hop. It's, it's across. And now, uh, online, if you go, go on Google, YouTube, you will find uh, hip hop uh, rappers uh, have uploaded uh, things in other religions uh, of the world. Yes, in other religions of the world. Uh, so, Buddhism, there are Buddhist rhymes or Buddhist rap uh, on, on, in YouTube, uh, Taoists, Hinduism, all of these ones also have raps that you can, you can go and have a taste of. Now, so even though it's practiced by this group, it has the core elements of what David Top or Toop uh, called hip hop in those days. So they say, well, these are the elements: DJing, MCing, break dancing, tagging. Tagging is graffiti. Yes, and what uh, Africa Bambata called overstanding. What do you think overstanding means? Anybody? No? Okay. But you know understanding. Yeah? So, understanding. This is one step ahead of... Bambata claims it is not sufficient in the resistance struggle, because hip-hop was quite often in the early days associated with resistance. It was revolutionary. It was not enough to just understand. If you just understand, then they could have you, the authorities could have you, the powers that be could have you. So as a hip hop uh, culture person, you have always to be one step ahead of the system. And that's what he termed overstanding. You know where they're coming from, you're ahead of the game, overstanding. Okay. Uh, one more thing to explain about, about holy hip-hop. You know, in, uh, in our secular world, somebody says something to you, say, I don't believe you. 
He said, okay, show me. Show me. Yes, I don't believe you. He said, show me. In other words, if you show me, then I might believe you. So seeing is believing. Yes, seeing is believing. In our secular world. But in the world of the Pentecostals, believing is seeing. It's a reversal. Believing is seeing. So, in conventional hip hop, then, if you're operating from seeing is believing, in holy hip hop, you're operating from believing is seeing. So, you can already begin to see that there are separations or differences uh, within the household of hip hop. Yes? Another thing, whereas in conventional hip hop, People regard it as a way of life. Yes? It's the, it's the way they talk, it's the way they dress, it's the way they walk. All of that is a way of life. So it's an end in itself. Yes? Hip hop is an end in itself, it's a way of life. In holy hip hop, it is a means to an end. How am I doing? Okay? It's a means to an end. Holy hip hop is a means to an end. And I explain what I mean by that. See, for your generation, a lot of people became disenchanted with religion. Yes? People became disenchanted with religion. Why would I, why would I go to church? Why would I want to go to the mosque? Why, why should I be religious when it's going to mean that I can't, I can listen to good music, I can't dance to good music, I can't do all these other things, I can't dress in a hip fashion. So holy hip hop takes control of that situation. And so the same baggy pants that you find in conventional uh, hip-hop, you find the, the, the religious hip-hoppers or the holy hip-hoppers, they dress in their baggy pants and their baggy t-shirts and their baseball hats. They dress the same way, they wear blinks as well, as I've mentioned. But the purpose is to bring back your generation into the fold. Yes, bring back your generation into the religious fold, the religious community. And boy, I think to a large extent it has worked. I think it has worked. Because suddenly you have this good music, yeah? I say, well, why do I need Jay-Z's music when I have Governor B singing this beautiful rhymes? Okay. Now, at the time that I was I was doing this, uh, I have I have a friend, or I had a friend who, an American who settled in, in Britain and, and worked and part part time on a, a, what you might describe as a pirate radio station, uh, a pirate radio station doing hip hop on that, but religious religious hip hop. Uh, it is of mixed, mixed race, mixed parentage. And it was fascinating discussing hybridity with him. Uh, because we went through a period uh, in cultural analysis when uh, mixed race people were described as half castes, yes, or mulatto. Uh, half caste means you're not full caste. And so the, the critique of that is that it's not politically correct to describe mixed race people as that. Uh, so they say, oh yeah, the biracial belonging to two races. Or dual heritage persons 
Okay? So this, this came to replace that. And the way that they dealt with hybridity within that discourse becomes a point of reference for us in thinking about hybridity uh, in relation to holy hip hop as well. And these this mixes uh, that, I talked, that I talked about. Of course, the fact that they tag some as politically correct or incorrect uh, suggests that you have tension and friction in that analysis. Okay? And, and those come from conflict within the constituent identities religion or the sacred and the secular. We, as I said, the, the one things that you would have in the same synthetic string, uh, but suddenly through holy hip hop, here we are actually mixing elements of, of this. Now, the framework within which we notice or observe these tensions and frictions is what I describe as the center periphery. So the center is the mainstream and the periphery is the alternative. Yes, what's the alternative? So hip hop, holy hip hop is the alternative. Conventional hip hop is the, is the mainstream, that's the center. So that's where the, is the negotiation between that center. And you know what? That negotiation is a successful one because at that time too, yes, uh, holy hip hop, or, or, or well, some other people have another name because it's not just hip hop; uh, it's religious music generally. Um, it's, it escapes my memory now. Uh, was not an award category in the mobile. It was not recognized as an award uh, uh, category. The Grammys didn't recognize that as an award category, but today they actually recognize and acknowledge these forms of expression. And that means the conversation or the negotiation that we mentioned earlier uh, has been successful. So, well, what used to be alternative is now mainstream, as in you find them being equally acknowledged and recognized on the Grammy platform. Yeah, on the Grammy platform. Center periphery, Barack Obama. Uh, at the time he was president, he's no longer president now. Yeah? So, let us dwell just a little bit on these two. Secularization, when the base register is sacred and a deliberate process is put in place to modify it to the everyday. That's secularization. So you're starting out from a base register that is sacred, is holy, religious. You secularize by toning down the religious content. Or you use the religious uh, 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 material or element for the everyday. And secularization, when the base register is secular, yes, it's secular. And then religious after that. So if you find a Pentecostal rappers who say yo, for example, yes, that base register uh, is secular. Yo is, re is, is secular. But in talking to a brother, a religious brother, in that context, that's secularization. So yo is not the secular word. It takes on a new meaning, a different meaning in that context. Of course, there are issues around ratio in the mix. How much of the secular are used in the sacred and how much of the sacred are used? Briefly, uh, you find in the literature hippopography, uh, hip hop ethnography, uh, and so on and so forth. A way of life we mentioned. Ethnography is its method. And ethnography means you enter the community that you're studying and you work with them. G Force, if I just quickly use that as an example. When I first heard about G Force, they were struggling. 
Yeah, they had just formed. Nobody knew anything about them. And then they put an album out. And, and so I wrote emails back and forth. I interviewed them by email. It never occurred to me to actually meet them in person because they were readily available. They, every, within um, a couple of hours of sending an email to them, they would write back to me. And I was just satisfied with that. And then they released an album, and in the blinking of an eye, they had a management team around them. They were nominated for the Mobile Awards. And then I wrote to them to say, I'd like a meeting. And I never, up until this day, I never got it. I never got a response. And then I wrote to the management team, I never got a response. So make hay while <laughs> the sun shines. Never live until tomorrow what you can do today. I wish that I had met them and established a rapport before they became, because suddenly fame came and they became inaccessible. So ethnography, it means you, you have to be working very closely and watching them within that. A uh, friend of a friend, this is, this is an approach that uh, Leslie Milroy uh, 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 premiered in, uh, or used in, Bel in her Belfast study in 1987. Okay, Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland and looking at notions of community and identity within that and language use. Uh, concerts, observation. So my, I mentioned my PhD student earlier. He's, he's, he's gone to so many of these. And then I ask him, where are your chapters? And he says, I'm still collecting. That's right. You've collected enough data. I think you're beginning to enjoy these concerts more than the PhD that you're doing. Uh, so observation. Yeah? Interviews, interviewing the artists themselves. Okay, either through writing or actually meeting with them and recording those. Uh, media, you have all these websites, holyhiphop.com, where you can, muslimhiphop.com, where you can download uh, materials, commentaries and so on that people have used. So, uh, Kimba, my friend that I mentioned who had worked in a pirate radio station, uh, his street name, so even though he was a, a holy hip hop person, they also have street names. And his name was DJ Clarity. Yes, DJ Clarity. G Force I've just mentioned. Uh, the Truth, Grammy Awards, nominee 2008, Blackstone, uh, reference to the Kaaba. Uh, Baby Muslims, that was another London group at the time. Uh, Baby Muslims, the youth focus of the ministry. This was fascinating. Yes, fascinating. Because when you saw young Muslims in the late teenage, you know, 1819, who were doing this, a lot of other teenagers wanted to be part of this. This was the thing I, I was referring to about bringing you back into the community, into Mecca to Medina. It's a journey. Okay. So I asked Clarity, what's, what's this about your, your mom calls you Kimba, but your Clarity? as far as everybody on the street is concerned. And he said, well, clarity came as a vision. This was his response to me. Clarity came as a vision. And vision is a religious thing. Not exclusively. Yes, we associate, tend to associate vision with religion. Governor B, uh, so this is a quote from some source, uh, is setting the urban music scene alight with Holy Ghost fire. Holy Ghost fire. So you can see the discourse, the language of religion in there. And governor uh, being an acronym for God's unique vessel now assigned. That's what governor, governor means. Yes? God's unique vessel now assigned. But when you look at that, it actually looks like the governor of a place. So kingdom, kingdom child. Okay. So I used, I mentioned the, the Turkish thing earlier. So battling was already happening long ago in some cultures. The 100K battle was something that Clarity participated in. And this, this is a transcript you know, of, of him. It's your boy Clarity, Kimba, AKA Paradise Skills. You can see the religious references, Paradise. Paradise Skills. Listen, I don't rap, I revelate, he says. So they don't call themselves rappers, they say they're revelators. The book of Revelation, people who reveal that which you don't know yet. Because wordplay is for artists, but I was told prophets produce 
the artists. Do you see the tension? As in, I am one step ahead or one ledge above the rappers. Conventional rappers, I am one step or one ledge above them. Use of bridging establishes link between clarity, the holy hip hopper, and the community of rappers through his participation because the 100K battle was not something that only the holy hip hoppers were doing. Conventional hip hoppers were involved in that. So by mixing with them and working with them, that located him in that community of practice. And it's a test of skill. And it was a regular thing. That's what uh, Lavi and Wenger tell us about community of practice. Yes? And they improve as a reason, as a consequence of, of that. And then the street setting of the back, where's the contextualization? Where is it happening? In line with subgenre practice in holy hip hop, clarity articulates a divergent identity away from the secular to the sacred through invoking paradise. So he said he's got paradise skills, the revelation and profit. So register analysis makes it possible for you to identify how he really does the separation. Yes? Register analysis. Uh, reaffirmation of the distinction between conventional hip hoppers and those who explore hip hop for a religious end. Yeah? So you might call all of us hip hoppers, but we have, we have different objectives. The religious ones are doing it you know, as a means to an end, and that end is going to heaven, getting as many people to heaven as possible. Whereas the conventional is for being. They all sample. Sampling is something that hip hoppers do a lot. It's just that uh, with holy hip hoppers, a lot of the sampling that they do come from religious sources. So, Clarity's Rare Jewels album or song samples from Psalm 23, verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I stay composed, no fear complex. So he's taken, he's taken Psalm 23 and turned that into, into rhyme. Though amongst greatest streets, lost souls, and petty beef, I ready hit from my pen on a blank sheet, my rap Fit is a track meet, taking buttons from the crippled and weak. Huh? Taking buttons from the crippled and weak. So what's that? Taking buttons from the crippled and weak. You're assisting, you're get healing them, uh, getting, uh, giving them energy, giving them force. Like Jesus was healing all those crippled and weak people. That's what he sees himself as a prophet. He talked about vision. Clarity mixes the psalmic reference with the traditional hip hop idea of gritty streets, of petty beefs. So, ah, uh, we've got a beef. So, he's using some of the codes of uh, conventional secular hip hop. We've got a beef. And track meets athletics as it takes the batons from the crippled and the weak. Rise up and walk. Yes, if you don't, for those of you who or used to that literature. Yeah? The cripple takes, Jesus takes, the, takes the, the stick or whatever it was. So he says, rise up and walk. Go. Uh, thus the text is neither wholly secular or sacred, but somewhere in between. That's the, that's the hybridity we were talking about. A third space. Now, we mentioned Holy Baba before. In social linguistics, Rakesh Bhatt has you know, done work on this, this notion of the third space, this, this hybridity thing. Okay, and it goes on like that because I've gone beyond my 40 minutes now. I'll just finish. Uh, Couture and other signifying codes, the hijab controversy and hip hop's liberal fashion, uh, selective adoption or adaptation. So, the tension and the friction that we talked about. Yeah, you can see them. So how do you do holy hip hop when in convention or conventional society uh, we have these debates going on in some places? Yes, 
about, about the hijab, different culture. So there's religious culture and there's secular culture. If secular culture is about hip hop, holy hip hop says, well, I'm hip hop too, but I have these other cultures that you don't subscribe to. Adoption and adaptation. Religious blings, I showed you that at the big crucifixes, uh, crescents, and star of David. This, you can go there and see uh, holy hip hop ministry. Uh, music is actually an established ministry in, 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 in religion. Uh, in Christianity, for example, Pentecostal uh, Christianity, there are people in the church whose business is the music ministry. And they use music to minister. Yes, they use music to minister. So within that arrangement, that's where holy hip hoppers would be located. They are in the music ministry. Yes, in the music ministry. Uh, welcome to holyhiphop.com. Our mission since 1997 is to take the gospel to the streets. Take the gospel to the streets through the global proliferation of spirituality, enlightening holy hip hop ministry, music and entertainment, glorifying Christ. You see the objective is plain and clearly stated. So when I talk about a means to an end, this is it. We appreciate you visiting us. Thank you for your prayers, support, and God bless. And then they put Psalm 146, verse 10. They never lose sight of the religious. And this is what Psalm 146, 10 says. The Lord shall reign forever, even thy God, O Zion, unto all generations. Praise ye the Lord. So there's a religious lesson. That's a, that's, that's a doctrine. That, that's included there. So you realize that the music is not the beat and end all. There's something beyond that. The boomerang hypothesis suggests that the hip hop, uh, that hip hop had little or no link to either Christianity or Islam. Yes. That's what the boomerang hypothesis was. Because this, the storytelling practice of the grill, or grills at that time, that was not religion based. In fact, Christianity, history will show that Christianity was not there yet. Yes, Christianity hadn't arrived. Applicability of sociolinguistics and discourse analysis tools uh, from some of the things that I have said, you can see I kept referring to uh, sociolinguistics. I talked about register analysis, uh, textual analysis in some of the things that we mentioned. Uh, with reference to ratio, variation in holy hip hop is, is it, can we talk of a continuum? Is it possible that something which you have a secular there and the sacred there, and that you can have points between the two of how much secular or how much sacred it is? You know, instead of instead of using binary distinction, one thing is happening in social linguistic scholarship or in scholarship generally. A lot of people are moving away from the binary, so n nothing is is that or that. There are all those middle points, you know, that it's not exactly, not exactly clear. Uh, no statistics. It is worth checking to establish the effect of holy hip hop on youth population for each faith. So you can, you can actually introduce statistics. Yeah? You can introduce statistics into your textual analysis as well by looking at the, the kind of codes that are used uh, C'est fini. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you actually did it in 45 minutes because we started a bit late. Ah, okay. So, uh, thank thank you. you very much for quite a fascinating talk that deals with a whole range of issues um, that go way beyond, goes way beyond uh, just language or uh, English. But uh, before I um, open for questions, um, I think I'd like to sort of quickly get into um, before the rest of the group start. And um, I put to you perhaps a, a rather radical statement, <laughs> and that would be, would hip hop and the, um, let's say, the influence of hip hop have been possible without English? 
spread of the spread of hip hop. You've shown is quite clearly. So yes. if it weren't for English, would we have what we've got now? It's a very dif that's a very difficult question, man. Yeah. Uh, but as um, as an indigenous language loyalist, I would say yes. So the Turkish the Turkish thing that I mentioned earlier. Uh, as long as we can establish that that Turkish culture, you know, existed independent of English, it means that that aspect of hip hop culture so didn't need English to. It. Now, if you're meaning, would it be as elaborate or as, as big as it is now? I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I know that in Nigeria, for example, there are a lot of uh, a lot of people are doing rap in, in local languages and doing rap uh, in, in Pidgin English. And Pidgin English is not, is not English. Uh, it's, it's, it's a language uh, that's not indigenous to here. It's indigenous to those parts of, of, of the world. Uh, so in that, in that sense, the fact that they produce those songs there, that, that, that these hip-hop culture there, and some of that then travels out into the West. I'm thinking, I'm thinking well, the globalization of culture and the flow, inflow, outflow, uh, will happen as a consequence of the forces of globalization anyway. Uh, I'm not able to categorically dismiss uh, the size of the enterprise. Well, I, I can't. I can't. Um, but I think that something, something is there, you know, that uh, may have blossomed in those places, but may be further assisted by the existence of uh, English, holy, um, English hip hop in these other parts of, of the world. And there were quite, quite, quite a number of artists in different parts of the, uh, of the world who started out by actually mimicking American, which is, which is why. So, uh, freaky. I think uh, th that's one word that I, I, I got out of uh, Penny Cooks. I, I, I don't know now whether 2003 or 2000, but sometime in the 2000s, uh, a paper that he did, and he was talking about Japanese, yes. Japanese, uh, and they're taking the English word. And the, is there any Japanese person here? No Japanese? No? Uh huh. Furiki. So freaky becomes Furiki. Yes. yes. In, in Japanese hip hop, in Japanese rap. Now, but, but we also have elements uh, of other languages in English, you know, as we, as we well know. So. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. But over to you. Who has any questions? Yes. Yeah. 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 And hoping that you will not be quiet and silent. Now, you've got to give me something. I've given you something. So I'm expecting something in return. I said to my students, you know, when I stand in front of the students and I talk to them like this, I think I know. But from the questions that they ask me, they let me know that I really don't know. That's what I'm expecting. Good. Yes. How do I think hip hop would develop in the future? I have a, I have a, because it's a, uh, it's a multi-million dollar business. Uh, people begin to make a distinction between commercial hip hop and real hip hop. Yes, real hip hop. Now, my issue is. If you do real hip hop, you still need your daily bread. Yes, you still need your daily bread. And so it's not possible to do away with, with, with commercial hip hop. And because of the way that the entertainment industry works, yes, quite a lot of people who probably started out holy hip hop or holy music, uh, church music, and we have a few examples like that. Uh, uh, Whitney Houston, 
You all know Whitney Houston? You've heard the name Whitney Houston? And she started up singing in church. And there are lots of people like that before she became uh, the popular entertainer. Yeah, so I, as far as hip hop is concerned, I have a feeling that the uh, holy hip hop brand across religions will grow some more. Uh, will grow some more. Uh, maybe at some point, because we're always constructing and deconstructing. Uh, so people go into religion, they come out of religion, maybe they go back into it again. So it's, it's an off and on, it's an off and on thing. Uh, the ones who are managing the business know exactly what they are looking for. And if one person is not playing ball anymore, then they look for somebody else who will play, who will play ball. Uh, the involvement of uh, hip hop in politics is another dimension to that. So where would, where would hip hop, hip -hop go? Uh, if the next uh, prime minister uh, is, a, is a rapper in Britain, uh -huh. I see you all smiling, say, how can that ever happen? Uh, who t what about what happened in America? Yeah, so it can happen. Anything can, anything can happen. You know, so uh, you mix commerce with politics, with an aspect of culture. You, you, can't, you can't cap it. It's kind of difficult to, to say this is how far it will go or it's going to die. Yeah? Hybridity? Yeah, of, um, the, kind of se the secular and the sacred? Yes. Yeah. Um, and you talked about like, the mixing of the languages or the kind of uh, codes. Um, I wanted to ask because I thought of like American vernacular English and how hip hop has been such a huge influence in how we now see American vernacular English today. Um, do you think that um, holy hip hop might end up having? like forming it into its own kind of um, um, just like American vernacular or the kind of more precisely the kind of hip hop um, English that we see particularly in American societies and in British societies today. Huh. Okay, uh, if I just try and tease out something here. Uh, American vernacular English is the language of a community, of a, of a group. In some literature, they actually call that Ebonics. Yes, so it's expressive of a particular culture. Expressive of a particular culture. It conveys that culture. It represents those people. The people who do holy hip hop here, uh, do their holy hip hop in the language of here, the dialect of here. But that's the same thing that you have in uh, 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 UK rock. Yes, UK rock music. And people do their rock music as UK artists in the language of here. Now, there's no gain saying the fact that they have also done research and seen elements of American English or Americanization in the language that artists use in this place from time to time, but not in a sustained way, yes? So the flow, the linguistic flow or the language flow uh, will, always, will always be there because of the, that belief, you know, that uh, hip hop started there. That's the home, that's the holy grail of, 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 of hip hop. So uh, young persons who are just starting out, uh, who are looking for their own identity, searching for it, uh, might take that. But as they get established, they come to realize, I really don't need to sound American to move this. In fact, there are a lot of British artists who go across the Atlantic and have become really uh, uh, popular. Adele, for instance. She's, she's a doyen of, 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 of America. They love her to bits in the place. But she never tries to speak American. She speaks British English when she's there. In fact, London, yes? That's what Adele does. You know, because then that becomes the identity of the brand that, that she's carrying. Yeah? So you might find mixes here and there between the different dialects that we have, 
Uh, but the essence, and we try to run away from essence because there is no es essence as far as identity is concerned, we constantly say this, is constructed. So I probably would sound more American if I wanted to create a certain, and I always say this, for those of us who came to the English language as a, uh, 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 as a second language, you know, post-colonial context, I find that when I go to America, after three or four days with my American friends, I sound more American. And when I come back to Britain with my British friends, after three or four days, I sound more British. You know, so we are constantly doing this stuff because it were a reflection of the, the community uh, that we're engaging, engaging with. I don't know whether that... I wanted to, because it was more specifically like, for example, just in the context of America or just in the context of Britain. Um, I want, because the idea of the, the kind of merging in of this religious... And of the sacred and the secular, yes. Oh, I see, I, see, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Right. Uh, so like translanguaging, the example that I gave you, remember I said with code switching you have language A and language B, yes, two distinct languages, and then we take elements uh, of A and we insert into B and say, ah, okay, you're code switching. You're going from A into B. Uh, but, but current scholarship now, uh, out of the U.S. and out of here, People are talking about trans language and say, well, it's not about A and B. It's about this code uh, that has its own, and people use it. it. You're not moving between languages. You're just use. This is all you know. Yes, this is all you know. Now, so yes, it is possible that part of language change or social change uh, in, in the long term might mean that when somebody gets on the rostrum, or on the platform, to, to do holy hip hop, he's only going to come out in a particular kind of code that people then recognize as, uh, because right now we were just saying uh, it's mixing the secular and the sacred, or mixing the sacred and the secular. That's because it's in the process of becoming, but it's always in the process of becoming because even the American and translanguaging, it, this, is, this is reference to a point, a point in time. Who knows what the uh, theoreticians will be saying in another five years? It took all that uh, uh, from the 70s, people talking code switching, until now, only about a few years back, do they start talking about translanguaging. So it's taking a while. Scholarship is like that, it, it, it keeps changing. So it is possible that holy hip hop may become associated with a defined, defined code. But there is, you must bear in mind that there is an element of dynamism. Yes, an element of dynamism. It's not static. Nothing is static. Okay. Yes. Huh. I, like, I like the fact that you use the word audience. Uh, Alan Bell talks of what, what he calls uh, audience design. Yes? In sociolinguistics, we talk about recipient design. Yes, recipient design. Uh, that is something we constantly do. We tailor uh, uh, the way we talk, the things we say or talk about, according to the audience that we have. Yes? All right. So... Does Kanye West uh, tailor the way that he, that, that he sings or speaks uh, according to a particular audience that... Uh, he probably does, depending on what he wants to do with the particular album. But I would think more along the lines of people who use music uh, to make ideological commentary or statements. Yes? To teach people something, an idea, an ideology. Yeah? Now, so they would use the language that the, the targeted audience can understand, the code that they can understand. They would use that. Otherwise, it doesn't make... I'll give you an example. Because we were talking about Ebola just before we came into class. 
when Ebola happened in 2014, there was a replay of 1985. Uh, sir, is it sir now or Lord? Bob Geldof. Is he a sir or, or Lord? Do you know? You know Bob Geldof? He's sir. He's sir. Sir Geldof, yes? Sir Geldof rallied the artists together to do a rehash of 1985, uh, the song that they did for Ethi the Ethiopian farming at that point, to help the Ebola victims. But these were all mostly Western artists, all singing in English. But before they did that, on the West African coast, in the, in the countries that were uh, um, uh, concerned or affected by Ebola, they had also rallied and got together uh, a group of local artists who sang using multilingual resources. Yes, they sang using multilingual resources. So that they had English, they had French, they had Wolof, they had all these other uh, uh, languages on the coast there. And then there was a debate. And the debate was, the magnitude of what Sir Geldof put together was global. That was big. But the resources that these guys on the ground on the West African coast had was limited. But they, in terms of penetration, they reached more people. Those local artists reached more people than the big global, and people, some people call that a charade. They said it was a charade. Now, because what the Ebola uh, uh, public health uh, authorities wanted to do was to teach the people, the local people, how not to get infected by Ebola. And so they chose the languages of the people. So this is in reference to your audience design. And that was, that was successful to a large extent because it cut down the number of infections drastically. Uh, they didn't make money. It was not for the purpose of making money. That was an ideological thing that they were doing at the point in time. So to go back to America and go back to Kanye West, I don't know what drives, uh, what drives him. I was wondering this uh, a couple of days ago, uh, just surfing the net. Because when Hillary Clinton was running for president, they had a selfie of, of uh, Kanye and, um, what's her name? Kim Kardashian and Hillary like that, all three of them. And then when the inauguration was about to happen, there was this news that was going around that Kanye was getting invited to come and perform at uh, President Trump's inauguration. And I said, I can't reconcile the two things. How do you take a selfie with one candidate and then you go and do inauguration music for another one? It didn't, it didn't add up. So in terms of this commercial thing, he probably saw that, I, I don't have confirmation for it, but he probably saw that as a good platform to get into the new regime, since now it was clear that Hillary was not going anywhere. Yes, I can get into the new regime. I do the show for free for Trump. Yeah? So the, the audience might be something that they have in mind. If, if people put songs together for teenage girls, they would use the language that teenage girls understand and that they can reconcile to. Yeah? So audience, yes, audience design is an important, is an important thing. Uh, it's something that is well worth researching or investigating to establish whether really, and in order to do that, uh, your strategy will be interviewing. You'd have to interview artists to get them to respond to you. Is this part of your consideration when you do the packaging of your music? Do you think about the audience in terms of selecting the language that you use? Yeah? Okay. Well, thank you very much for the brave souls who asked the question. So for our next speaker, um, which will be in early March, I'm sure you can come up with a few more questions as well. I'd like to thank you again very thank you. much for your very interesting talk. Thank you. That is actually much more than just looking at English.